Thank you very much, Mr. Haneda, for your kind introduction. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and privilege to be here in Japan and to be here at this uh, great venue. Uh, as mentioned, I visited Japan to be present at the enthronement of the new emperor. It was a historic occasion, of course, it was uh, magnificent, but simplistic, simple at the same time, simple at the same time. And uh, uh, while I, of course, was there to represent the people and the Republic of Iceland, for me as a historian, it was in particular interesting to witness this historic occasion. And I have uh, been met with the utmost hospitality here in Japan and uh, look forward to visiting you again. I don't know when, don't know where, at what occasion, but I'll certainly be back here again, I hope. And you are all welcome to visit Iceland. And part of my, uh, my uh, uh, visit to this uh, university uh, involved seeking ways to enhance uh, relations between uh, Icelandic universities and universities in Japan, including this one. So I hope maybe I get to see you, some of you, at the University of Iceland or other institutes of higher education uh, back home. So, as mentioned, I am a historian by profession. And uh, what I want to cover with you uh, today are examples from the history and current uh, times in Iceland about uh, us Icelanders and the state of Iceland having an influence on the world scene. Now, we can, let's begin at the beginning, Iceland. It's a very young state, a young nation, also geographically. Uh, the oldest part of Iceland, the island itself, 16 million years, a long period, of course, uh, when you compare it with uh, human history, but only a fraction of, of the history of, of the world itself. The most ancient rocks in, in, in the world are more than uh, 4,000 million years old. Iceland, however, 16 million years old. So a young country in that regard. It's also a young nation. Iceland was only uh, discovered by humans or settled by humans some 11, 1,200 years ago. Maybe at some stage before that, some, some uh, adventurers strayed to the country. But settlement really began, let's say, in the, possibly in the 8th and 9th centuries uh, uh, in earnest. Settled by, mostly by uh, Norse people and Celtic people from the British Isles. And you could argue, or it's safe to th conclude, that uh, uh, after a few decades or uh, centuries, about maybe 50,000 people live in Iceland. Now, this is, this is not uh, uh, an exact figure. We don't know it for sure. But it's a small nation and a small island. and. How is it possible for uh, a nation of that kind to influence global events? Let's look at that uh, as we move on to the present. Now, this 
young uh, society uh, was um, constructed gradually. And uh, of course, many important events happened. We can look at the year 930, uh, foundation of parliament in Iceland, where the chieftains of the country gathered together and decided we have to have a set of laws for this society of ours. Few decades after that, uh, Icelandic, uh, or men who lived in Iceland, sailed westwards, further westwards, discovered what we now know as Greenland, and then even further west, and uh, sailed to what we now know as North America. There was no uh, lasting settlement, and there were conflicts with the, uh, with the people who were there before them, the indigenous population. But you can wonder, what would have happened in world history, if there had been a lasting settlement, if the Nordic or Norse discovery of this new continent, uh, of course it was uh, already populated, but if these first people coming from Europe had managed to create a lasting settlement on this vast and new continent, wouldn't that have changed world history completely? We do not know, of course, but what we do know is that they set foot there and then uh, there was hardly any uh, connection afterwards. But this is almost like a missed opportunity for this small nation, Iceland, to influence world, world affairs to a great degree. The people of Iceland uh, lived from the land, from what the land gave them. It was a harsh life and uh, tough life, yet some of them managed to uh, compose uh, sagas, stories about life in Iceland, which are a true contribution to world literature. So maybe we can begin there. If you talk about the influence of this emerging nation, it is the contribution to world literature. So you have writers there of marvelous tales, stories about, including the discovery of these new lands further westwards, the sail, sailing to Greenland, or what we now know as Greenland, and then to North America, stories about these adventures, and stories about family feuds, struggles between clans, struggles about love and honor, magnificent tales, tales which have survived and arguably rank as Iceland's greatest contribution to world literature. So there's one lesson there to be had. A small nation, a small state, can contribute to the mosaic that is world culture and world literature. And we need to keep that in mind. Because uh, when you look at the globe as a whole now, uh, we are living in a world of globalization, of uh, uh, ever increasing connections between nations and states, and that is great. But we must avoid uh, uh, a negative uniformity where everyone is in the same mold. So Icelandic literature, Japanese literature, Icelandic culture, Japanese culture, to take examples, should be part of the mosaic that is world culture. And then we can connect the Icelandic sagas, for instance, have been connected with Japanese manga. You have scholars and others who, uh, who merge these two trends and discover and create something new. So I will suggest to you that when it comes to the might of the weak or influence of Iceland on the world scale, let's begin with Icelandic literature and the Icelandic sagas. This is our contribution to world literature. Now, in the 13th century or so, when many of these sagas were written, uh, civil strife in Iceland led to uh, Iceland 
becoming part of the Kingdom of Norway. Uh, these centuries before had been a time of the so-called Icelandic Commonwealth, when, uh, when uh, Icelanders, as it were, ruled themselves without a king, without, uh, without uh, ties to, to the Kingdom of Norway. But in the late 13th century, Iceland became part of the Kingdom of Norway. And then the Kingdom of Norway merged with the Kingdom of Denmark, and Iceland came under Danish rule. And, you know, I am giving you a very short and abridged version of uh, a complex past. But uh, the traditional version of Icelandic history went like this. Glorious centuries of the Commonwealth and independence from settlement to the 13th century. And then from the 13th century onwards, uh, demise and uh, tragedy under foreign rule. First under Norwegian rule and then... Danish rule. You had epidemics, volcanic eruption. So by the 18th century or so, the population of Iceland was down to 30,000 or so. One disaster uh, followed another. And a big one, and again, talk about the influence of Iceland on world affairs. Let's move to the year 1783. There was a huge volcanic eruption in Iceland. The uh, Laki eruption, the so-called Laki eruption from 1783 to 84. Had a huge impact in Iceland. Lost a quarter of the population, 70 or 80% of livestock, a huge disaster. And there were people in Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, who wondered, should we just not move everyone from this disaster-stricken island to Denmark? How can you live on an island like this? Uh, this was not really thought through and was never about to happen, but it shows the severity of this, uh, of this catastrophe. And indirectly, you can say that events in Iceland contributed to huge events in European history just a few years back. Remember 1783-84? Big eruption in Iceland, clouds of ash all over continental Europe, bad harvests. And then for you, those of you who know your European history, 1789, the French Revolution, great anchor there. And you can, you can connect it to these bad harvests the year before. So half jokingly, you can say Iceland caused the French Revolution and talk about having influence on, on the world scene. And, of course, in this day and age, when we are looking at uh, climate change, global warming, uh, ever-increasing uh, fluctuations in weather, uh, we need to sense this power of, uh, of nature on human affairs. So, if we, if we take history as a, in general, let's say we have a missed opportunity to influence world affairs by not settling what we now know as North America around the year 1000 or so. Let's look at Iceland's contribution to world literature, a demonstration of the fact that we can have a role on the world scene through culture, through literature, the Icelandic sagas. And then nature, whatever happens in a one part of the world can influence events elsewhere when we're looking at uh, natural catastrophes and take climate change uh, today. Now, however, we need to move closer to the, to the uh, present. Uh, remember also what I said about uh, looking at Icelandic history, first these uh, centuries of independence and uh, outside of foreign uh, domination, and then from the 13th century, first under the Kingdom of Denmark, then the Kingdom of, no, sorry, Kingdom of Norway, and then the Kingdom of Denmark. But in the 19th century, there was a national awakening of sorts. Uh, Icelandic intellectuals, 
uh, people who went to Denmark to study uh, and others realized with currents in Europe at the same time, the currents of nationalism, uh, the belief that nations should have their own state, these currents reached Iceland. So uh, gradually Iceland gained increased rights from Denmark. In uh, 1840s you have the uh, 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 the uh, uh, national gathering and the uh, uh, reconstitution of the old Icelandic parliament, the Althing, 1874, a constitution for Iceland, 1904, home rule, the first minister for Iceland residing in, in Iceland, 1918, uh, sovereignty, the state of Iceland comes into being just after the uh, end of the First World War. And these events are connected to developments abroad. Whatever happens outside of Iceland influences events in Iceland. And conversely, events in Iceland are influenced by what happens abroad. So the state of Iceland comes into being on the 1st of December 1918. Uh, still, we have as our sovereign the King of Denmark. And uh, the Danes still handle Iceland's foreign affairs, so there are, there are still ties with the, with, the, uh, with the Danish kingdom. A basic tenet then in Iceland's uh, foreign policy and, fo and security policy was complete neutrality. Uh, Iceland was going to stay outside any future conflicts. That would be our uh, defense against uh, the tragedy of possible war uh, outside Iceland, sure. We're just going to stay out of it. Complete neutrality. Uh, that, however, came to an end with the uh, onset of the Second World War. In uh, May 1940, Iceland was um, uh, occupied by Britain, and this is the onset of the Second World War in Europe, but it was a friendly occupation, uh, so to speak. Uh, we have this anecdote that uh, in the middle of the night, a minister in the Icelandic cabinet was woken up and told, uh, Sir, there are some planes flying around Reykjavik, uh, the Icelandic capital. And he replied, well, can you see whether they're German or whether they're British? And he got the reply, well, they're British. And then he said, well, that's fine. I'll just go back to sleep. <laughs> so uh, following that, in 1941, Iceland made a defense agreement with the United States, maintaining neutrality, uh, the Jure, but to all intents and purposes, Iceland was on the Allied side uh, in the war. And in June 1944, Iceland severed all ties with Denmark, became a republic. And uh, the first president of Iceland uh, took office on the 17th of June 1944. Foundation of the republic, and then the war comes to an end, and this young state one of the smallest states in the United Nations had to, uh, had to uh, find its way in the world. How can we safeguard Iceland's interests as a small state on the world scene? And can we possibly at the same time have a say in the world, uh, shape the world as we want it to be? Is that possible for a small state on the international scene. Let's cover a bit power in international relations and the capabilities of small states to act on the world scene. If you take uh, studies in realism, for instance, you would get the basic old premise that the strong do 
what they want, and the weak just have to accept what the strong wish. This is like Thucydides from the, you know, the Greek uh, historian and philosopher. It's just a matter of size, how big is your country, how big is your army, and that dictates the uh, development of world affairs. If that were the case, of course, Iceland would be in trouble. We don't have an army. And we are, how many people live in Iceland? It's, it's me, it's my mother, it's my family. 350,000 people. So uh, if you only measure influence in world affairs by the size of your country, the size of your army, then it goes without saying that Iceland will not fare well in, uh, in that playing field. But fortunately for Iceland, it's not so uh, uh, simple. Another issue to consider is uh, what you can call the, uh, I'm almost tempted to say the struggle, the struggle between uh, national interests and morality. Do you do the right thing in terms of morality, human rights, and so on and so forth, or do you focus on your practical interests? Let's say trade, for instance. Uh, this leads me to one of the aspects of uh, Iceland and the outside world I want to cover with you when we look at Iceland after independence in 1944. I'm going to talk to you about Iceland and human rights, and then I'm going to go through two aspects of Iceland's history which are of particular interest to me because I studied them when I was a historian, but not only because of that, but because they are good examples of uh, a small state like Iceland having an influence on the world stage. So to begin with there, I will go over the Cod Wars with you. Fishing disputes between Iceland and other countries, uh, mostly Britain, where Iceland was able to uh, uh, have its way, even though it was uh, in a dispute with a much bigger country, Great Britain. So that's one thing. And the other thing is Icelandic support for Baltic independence in 1990, 1991. 1991 was the year when the Soviet Union collapsed, came to an end, and the three Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, were uh, released from uh, the Soviet yoke, and Iceland, in an indirect way at least, uh, uh, played a modest role there. But first, human rights and what we can call real politics or real interests. Iceland, having become a sovereign state in 1918, independent in 1944, member of the UN uh, shortly after the foundation of the United Nations, uh, wanted to support other peoples, other nations uh, struggling for independence. So in the 1950s, 1960s, when you see a proliferation of states in the UN, many states being formed, declaring independence from colonial masters, you will see and hear the voice of Iceland at the UN saying, we support all nations who are striving for independence. We are against colonial rule. And this was solemn, and this was honest, and this was a positive step to show support for others who were in the same steps that we were. All well and good. However, Iceland is a small nation in the middle of the North Atlantic. And in that time, and up to today, we rely on exports of fish. We need to sell fish. You need to purchase fish. <laughs> you need to eat Icelandic fish. <laughs> so, do you deliver your speech about morality, about the right of, uh, right of 
peoples to declare independence and control their own affairs if it interferes with selling fish. I will not give you specific examples, but this was a dilemma for the Icelanders. We, are, we have a big and important fish market here in this country. At the same time, we are telling this country that it needs to uh, let go of its colonial possessions. How can we do that? How can we say the right thing and at the same time sell our good and precious fish? How can we not offend and be the voice of morality and justice at the same time? And this was a, could be a difficult uh, path to follow. So I am reminded of a, uh, of a comment or uh, explanation by the philosopher Reynold Niebuhr, who said that human affairs are about this. Uh, I should actually find it in my, in my uh, text here so that I will give you the correct, uh, the correct uh, quote. Yes, Nieper said in the early 1930s, politics will, to the end of history, be an area where conscience and power meet, where the ethical and coercive factors of human life will interpenetrate and work out their tentative and uneasy compromises. So I take this example to demonstrate to you that Iceland, a small nation, sympathized with other small nations. It sympathized with other peoples trying to declare their independence and gain what we had gained. But at the same time, we had to consider that we are a small nation that uh, cannot control what goes on in the world. A small nation that cannot ignore its interests when it comes to trade and the economy. So there's a tightrope there uh, to walk. Uh, we back home uh, in academia, for instance, have uh, been really interested in this aspect of international relations. So at the University of Iceland, you have a center for small state studies uh, where my former colleagues are doing wonderful work looking at the influence of small states on the international scene. Also peace studies uh, where uh, we like to contribute, keeping in mind the fact that we do not have a military and we do not have to make difficult decisions on sending people uh, to, uh, to uh, battle, but we like to think that we can contribute and use our experience uh, in, in this regard. So, I mentioned fish, and now I'm going to talk more about fish. Let's go and look at the cod wars, the fishing disputes between Britain, mostly Britain, I will just focus on Britain here mostly between Britain and Iceland in the latter half of the 20th century. An integral part of Iceland's struggle for independence was to gain sovereignty of our natural resources, i.e. the marine resources outside, or outside Iceland in the waters of Iceland. Uh, we can begin at the start of the 20th century when Iceland and Britain had an agreement on three mile limits of territorial waters around Iceland. So if you have Iceland here, three miles uh, outside Iceland was the territorial waters of Iceland. It's pitiful. The British trawlers, these fishing vessels, uh, would fish right up to Iceland's shores. And uh, for the Icelanders, uh, a vital step towards full independence would be to gain control of the fishing grounds around Iceland. We were not alone in this. Development of the law of the sea was moving in Iceland's favor. But after independence in 1944, we took gradual steps in, in gaining full sovereignty of our fishing grounds. So in 1952, Iceland declared a four mile limit uh, around the island. Britain protested. The British message was three miles 
is the international rule, and we are perfectly happy with that, and we do not accept this extension of Iceland's fishing limits. At the time, the British market for Icelandic fish was of vital importance. And uh, in this dispute, the British side replied by closing it off, saying, all right, until you go back to three miles, or until you start negotiating with us, we are not willing to open up our market for you. And this could have been devastating for Iceland. However, at this time, the Cold War had erupted. We have a Cold War and we have a Cold War. I'm sure you're more familiar with the Cold War, but we're going to focus on the both of them now, and because they mix together. Iceland, a founding member of NATO in 1949, and in 1951 uh, had uh, accepted uh, the presence of U.S. troops, the opening up of a U.S. military base on the island. So we were a vital chain in Western defenses at the height of the Cold War, the struggle between East and West, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So what happens in 1952 when our allies in NATO, the British, closed down their markets so vital for us. Well, in steps the Soviet Union. We get a message from Moscow. We hear that uh, you are in trouble selling your fish. We are willing to buy your fish. And this was a blessing for the Icelanders. So they could continue declaring the formal limit, sell the fish to the Soviet Union, and this British weapon of forcing us to back down didn't work. So in 1956, the British side grudgingly accepted the new four-mile limit. We did not stop there. Neither did other states. The Soviet Union, for instance, declared the 12-mile limit, and Britain could do very little about that. You're not going to threaten the Soviet Union like you could with, with Iceland. And international law was flowing in Iceland's favor. So in 1958 and 1960, you have a law of the sea conferences where you can clearly see that the world is changing in this regard. And in 1958, on the 1st of September, Iceland declares a 12 mile limit from four to 12. Now that's enough, the British side says. We cannot accept this because they, these fishing grounds were still vital for uh, the British trawlers, these fishing vessels uh, which uh, uh, had for decades uh, sailed up to Iceland and caught fish there, mostly caught, and they were in no way willing to stop that. Now, previously, shutting off the British market, that hadn't worked. So how can you respond now? Well, in Britain, they decide to dispatch the Royal Navy up to the waters of Iceland. So uh, uh, a situation arises where you have the Icelandic Coast Guard against the Royal Navy, the might of the Royal Navy. In the mid of the 20th century, Britain is still a strong naval power. The Icelandic Coast Guard, with all respect, was not a great naval power. My grandfather was a captain on one of the vessels uh, involved in, the, in this conflict, which quickly became known as the Cod War. So, what would happen? You would have British fishing vessels, these trawlers, sailing up to the waters around Iceland, and under protection by a Royal Navy vessel, a frigate. The Icelandic Coast Guard vessel would try to sail close by and order the British fishermen to back down. They would take a loud hailer and they would say in strong Icelandic words, you are fishing illegally in Icelandic waters. You must leave immediately. But what would the British fishermen say? Well, basically just bugger off. We are here because these are international waters. And if you're not happy with that, look at that Royal Navy frigate over there. So it was a standoff. There was very little that the Icelanders could do, except 
use our leverage. That's what small nations do. We use our level, leverage. Remember, we're a member of NATO. We have a vital US military base on the island. So, and I'm talking figuratively here. You mustn't think I'm saying, you know, that this is what actually happened, but an Icelandic prime minister would take up the phone and he would call Washington DC and say, well, unless you tell the British side to back down, I am calling Moscow. <laughs> Again, I am exaggerating. I am just trying to get this image across of the importance of Iceland during the Cold War. This was a weapon. So we could always say to our allies, the US and the British, hold on. This is our vital interest here. We cannot be in an alliance with Britain when Britain is sending warships up to Icelandic waters to, uh, to, to harm us. And the Americans would say, they would dial London, hold on here, you are upsetting our vital strategic interests. For what? For fish? Come on, back off. So this worked in Iceland's favor. And also the image. We are getting the image across in international media of small little Iceland protecting its vital interest at the same time that people are moving from the world of colonies, the world of empire, to the world of independent states. And you have here this small innocent Iceland and the might of the Royal Navy. It's a negative image for Britain. So this worked in our favor. And last but not least, the development of international law. So in 1961, three years after the onset of the conflict, the British backed down. They make an agreement with Iceland. All right, fair enough. We'll accept this new limit, this new limit of 12 miles. But you have to agree with us if you want to expand the limit again, and we are not happy with it, we will refer the dispute to the International Court of Justice. We will just have the International Court of Justice declare who is in the right. All right? And the Icelanders accepted that at the time. So we move on to 10 years, to 1971. 61 agreement is made like this, ending the 12 mile dispute or the first Cold War. 71, a new government comes into power in Iceland, a left wing government. And they say, we are going to extend the limit from 12 miles to 50 miles. This is our vital interest we're talking about here. Sovereignty over the fishing grounds. And remember, this is where the way the world is moving. The nations of South America and Latin America in the late 1940s, 1950s, they declared 200 miles. Some nations in Africa and other parts of the world as well. So we are also following the footsteps of others. But the British side says again, uh, we are not willing to accept this. And remember the treaty from 1961. If we have a disagreement, we refer, to, we refer it to the International Court of Justice. But, and again, I'm simplifying a complex story here, but the message from Iceland was, well, that was another government. We have a new government now. <laughs> so, in 1972, again, on the 1st of September, 1st of September, that's a monumental day in Iceland's history, recent history, we extend the limit from 12 miles to 50 miles. Again, the British side, among others, is not willing to accept this. And again, they dispatch the Royal Navy to protect British fishermen in what the British side says is international waters. And remember what had happened last time around in the 12 mile dispute in the first Cod War. You are fishing illegally. It didn't work. However, Talk about Iceland's contribution to uh, world affairs. We invented a weapon. Believe it or not, Iceland without a military, we invented a weapon. Now, uh, let's see. This is a British trawler, right? A trawler is a fishing vessel. And it has a trawl. You know, a trawl, like a net. So this is the trawler, and this is the net. You put it down like this, and then you pull it up, 
And in the process, it catches fish. It catches Icelandic fish. <laughs> we are not happy with that. So the weapon that the Icelanders invented is known as the cutters. So you have the trawler, and you have the trawl full of Icelandic fish, like this. But this would be the cutters with a Coast Guard vessel. So we would sail and cut the wires between. <laughs> so you would have the Icelandic fish in Icelandic water still, and furious British fishermen. This totally changed the scene uh, on the in the disputed fishing grounds. Now we could actually disrupt the fishing. The British side was furious. You are not allowed to do this. You, you're breaking international law. But we said, you are breaking international law. You are breaking Icelandic law. And this is just a test of strength. So as the Icelandic Coast Guard vessels were doing this, sailing like this, cutting away the, the trawls, the fishing nets, the Royal Navy vessels, the frigates and other types of vessels would try to intervene, would try to prevent the Icelandic Coast Guard from getting close. This was serious matter. This uh, led to collisions, which could have led to the loss of life. And actually, one Icelandic shipmate died after a collision when he was repairing. And on other occasions, it's basically a miracle that no vessels went down with loss of life. It was a very dangerous game. Collis collisions at sea are always dangerous. And the Icelandic message was again, hold on, if you don't stop doing this, we'll, we will leave NATO, we'll shut down the US base. Again, this strategic importance is so vital. But you may also ask, you have a Royal Navy frigate. A frigate is a big war vessel. You have guns, you have mortar. And you could just say, okay, you Icelanders, if you do not stop harassing British fishermen, in international waters, we will fire at you. So back off or else. We will use the might of the Royal Navy. But again, can you imagine? Both on the international scene, let's say a headline in the New York Times or the Spiegel in Germany or Japan Times or what have you. British Navy vessel sinks Icelandic gunboat. Can you imagine? No, this was, this just could not happen. A fellow member of NATO, you do not fire at a fellow member in NATO. So again, the importance, the strategic importance of Iceland helped us immeasurably, as well as the development of the law of the sea, as well as this image of the big bully fighting small little Iceland. Agreement was reached in 1973, the British side grudgingly accepted this new 50 mile limit and in London there was clear realization that uh, gradually uh, you would have to accept this extension of fishing limits and territorial waters uh, worldwide. However, we still had one more conflict in the mid 1970s when Iceland went all the way 200 miles. Basically the same thing happened, uh, conflicts at sea, cutting of trawl wires and clashes between Royal Navy vessels and, and the Coast Guard. But in mid-76, the British side realized that the game was up. And ever since, uh, we have enjoyed the 200 mile uh, exclusive economic zone. But this is a lively subject still. Here in Japan, you only have to look at waters in the vicinity and uh, disagreements between nations to realize that wherever there is an ocean and wherever there is fish, there will be disagreements. And not to mention also uh, the ocean floor where there is uh, uh, wealth to be found, as it were. So this was the Cod War and it demonstrates that a small state can punch above the weight, as it were, can protect its vital interests uh, and that might is not the only measurement. 
if, if it was only a matter of who had the biggest warships, then the British side would have beaten us in a day. But fortunately, for a small state like Iceland, the international world doesn't operate like that. You have the rule of law, you have also alliances, which helped us immeasurably, and you have public opinion. All these factors came to Iceland's aid. So the court wars are an example of a small state being able to protect its vital interests because of these factors. And the, these, these conflicts are, uh, are so enshrined in Iceland's uh, collective uh, memory that uh, 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 if ever you come to Iceland and uh, ask Icelanders about the Cod Wars, they will tell you, well, that's when we beat the British. I'm very happy about that. Now, uh, the other aspect I wanted to talk to you about describing Iceland's influence on the world scene was the Baltic states. So, I don't know how well you remember these dates I have given you, but in 1918, sovereignty. Iceland becomes a separate state, still under the, uh, with, a, with a Danish king as sovereign, but to all intents and purposes, a separate sovereign state, 1918. At the same time, the Baltic states declare independence. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, the Estonian president and the Latvian president, and I believe the Lithuanian president, were also here at the enthronement uh, stage, which regained their independence in 1991. But if you want to see contrast between small states, look at Iceland on the one hand and the Baltic states on the other. So they also declare independence, yes, in 1918, but in the Second World War, our paths divide. We declare full independence and enjoy economic prosperity and freedom in the decades after that. They are uh, annexed into the Soviet Union in 1940, suffer the horrors of the Second World War, and then afterwards uh, remain under Soviet rule. Uh, naturally, as it, and it goes without saying, totally against the wishes of the people themselves. Then we fast forward to the 1980s. There's a, there are fresh winds of change in the Soviet Union. There's talk about reform, perestroika, glasnost, uh, Russian terms for this spirit of change. And in the Baltic countries, the conclusion is clear. Well, if we're going to talk about reform, reform, democracy, human rights, give us what we deserve, full independence. So by the late 1980s, you have leaders of these three uh, Baltic nations, the Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians, calling on the international community to support them. At the same time, we are hoping that you will see an end to the conflict between East and West, between the US-led Western world and NATO and the Soviet Union. You want to see uh, disarmament and you want to see uh, the end of tension in the world. So, Many leaders in the Western camp are hesitant to support completely the wishes of the Baltic states. They say to themselves and others, we have to do this in a controlled manner. If we are pressed too fast and too hard for Baltic independence, you can see a rise of hardliners in Moscow who will topple the reformers there, led by Mikhail Gorbachev, and you will have the worst situation possible. So let's show moderation, let's be patient. Let's just not rock the boat, as the, uh, as the Western side uh, said. This was a source of some disappointment in Baltic circles. Hold on, don't we deserve independence? They would say to the Western world. You talk about freedom, you talk about human rights, you talk about the rights of nations, and here we are under Soviet rule, you should support us. And this message also reached Iceland. 
So in, let's say, early 1990, when uh, these voices from the Baltic states were growing ever louder, the authorities in Iceland decided, yes, we must support these nations who gained independence in 1918, like we, but had this tragic history of subjugation, oppression uh, in the 20th century. We should be the voice of support. Well, did that matter? There was one conference in the summer of 1990 when the Icelandic delegate, it was a uh, OSCE, o OSCE conference, uh, where the Icelandic delegate said, we in the Western world, we must support the Baltic peoples. And afterwards, a US delegate came up to the Icelander and said, well, that was a great speech you gave there. Isn't it nice? It must be nice to be representing a small country where you can say whatever you want, but it doesn't have any effect. <laughs> it was a sort of backhanded compliment. The message there was, a small nation can say whatever they want because they're not listened to. In January 1991, uh, Tragic events occurred in, in the Baltic countries. In Lithuania, uh, Soviet troops attacked uh, uh, scores of people. 14 people were left dead. In uh, Latvia, the neighboring country, at least four people died in skirmishes or clashes between Soviet security forces and the, and, uh, the Latvian side. And almost like an SOS signal was sent from the Baltic countries to the West. You must show us support now. You must demonstrate that you are on our side. And uh, uh, the uh, leader of the uh, Lithuanian independence camp, he basically called the foreign minister of Iceland and said, if you've meant anything by what you've been saying, you must support us now. Come to us. And the Foreign Minister of Iceland did this. Uh, it was complicated. Lithuania was still under Soviet rule, so you had to apply for a Soviet visa. But he said, well, what the hell? We, I have to get there. Demonstrate support for the Baltic cause. And this was so well received because uh, this Foreign Minister was the only Foreign Minister actually to go there at this time of tension showing moral support. This greatly appreciated step uh, was welcomed, yes, but at the same time, the Lithuanians in particular, but also the Latvians and the Estonians, would have liked Iceland maybe to take another step, declare uh, or, or uh, yes, resume diplomatic relations with these countries at the same time as they were still under Soviet rule. This the Icelandic side was not willing to do uh, or unable to do. They said, you know, we have to look at the situation as it is. These countries are still under Soviet control, so we cannot just pretend that that is not the case. We have to, we have to move slowly. We have to take it step by step. But we're willing to give you all the more moral support we can give. And then history takes over, as it were. There is a, there is a coup d'etat, as it were, in Moscow in August 91. And uh, Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, is toppled. Uh, but then the coup fails and he returns. But it's all in a flux. And this was a window of opportunity for the Baltic states. So they all declare full independence and call on the West. You must support us now. And this is what the Western camp did led by the Nordic countries, Iceland, Denmark, Norway, and then uh, to a slightly lesser degree, Sweden and Finland, full support. And it pleases us Icelanders that we were able to be the first uh, Western state to formally resume diplomatic relations between uh, a Western country and Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. So they will say to this day, you were the first, you broke the ice, you were the icebreaker on the international scene. 
thank you forever, thank you, thank you, thank you. Whenever an Icelander goes to a Baltic country, we are reminded of this, this gratitude. Now, did it matter? Can you imagine a scene like this? A discussion in the White House in Washington. Well, we must recognize the independence of the Baltic countries. Why? Someone would ask. Well, don't you know? Iceland has done it already. <laughs> With all respect, this is not how things work. We were not able to influence others in this regard. However, the uh, moral support given was vital. Uh, the United States recognized the independence of the Baltic states on the, if I remember correctly, 6th of September 91, whereas we did it around the 24th, 25th, 26th of August. Uh, so when the US took this step, the then president, President George Bush, was asked, well, you uh, are taking this step slightly la later than others. Uh, why was that the case? And then President Bush replied, well, when history is written, nobody is going to remember that we were a bit later than Iceland or whoever it was. <laughs> well, not in the Baltic countries. They remember this. And it, it's kind of pleasing that at least President Bush remembered that it was Iceland, <laughs> even though in his mind it didn't matter that much. So what I'm trying to tell here is that a small state like Iceland will not control directly decisions in bigger countries, not to mention uh, a superpower like the US. However, that does not mean that our voice is totally unheard or like totally unnoticed. Uh, and the moral support you can give is of importance. And remember what I also said about human rights and fish and how Iceland sometimes would not, you know, emphasize human rights where fish markets were at stake. Well, in this case, the Soviet Union was still an important market for uh, Icelandic products. And we were still willing to offer this moral support for the Baltic side, for our good friends in the Baltic countries. And sometimes you just have to take that risk. If you always put your economic interests first and push aside morality and the right thing to do, then ultimately you will run into trouble. You will be accused of uh, duplicity. And uh, that is not what you want to do on the international scene. So again, here is an example of Iceland being able to play a role on the international scene. Punch above your weight, as it were. So, these are stories I wanted to tell you about a small state on the international scene. The history with, uh, with our literature, sagas, contributing to the French Revolution via a natural disaster. That's, that's a fair accomplishment. Human rights versus economic interests, how that interplay is complex when you're a small nation. The court wars, how a small nation can have its way against a bigger side when vital interests are at stake and when you're in an alliance and when you have international law flowing in your favor, and when, uh, when you have international opinion on your side. The Baltic case, where you demonstrate moral support and in an indirect way are able to influence uh, the uh, development uh, outside your shores. So let's go back, as we conclude, to uh, culture, to literature. Uh, we in Iceland are so proud of the fact that we are still able to uh, point to individuals who are making it big on the international scene. Some of you may have heard of the singer Björk, the Icelandic pop singer Björk. Just recently, uh, we have a musician, classical pianist, Víkingur Heiðar, 
nominated the Gramophone Artist of the Year, which is big in classical music, believe me. Hildur Guðnadóttir wrote the music for uh, the popular TV series Chernobyl. You may not have heard of these names, but these are individuals who come from a small country like Iceland, are blessed by uh, nature and upbringing and training and devotion to become one of the best in their fields and demonstrating that even though you come from a small country, you can uh, be heard on the international scene. So that is another example of when we are thinking about a small state like Iceland and how we can contribute, let's also look at literature and culture. That is our playing field, our level playing field, where expertise and devotion and compassion matters greatly. Let us also look at, finally, uh, human rights still. Yes, we have to look at uh, real politique, and we will never be able to uh, uh, control world affairs, but we can still be the voice of reason, the voice of uh, uh, defending those who need defending. So therefore, Iceland plays its role within the UN, at the Human Rights Council and other avenues or other venues, uh, accepting the fact that the world is a complex place and you do not change it overnight. But slowly but surely, we believe that we are moving in the right direction and we play our small part in that. Can we be an example to others? Can we look at Iceland and say, yes, we are small, but follow our example and then you will do well. Yes, we can do that. Let's take the example of gender equality. Iceland for the last 11 years has been top of the gender equality index. This is a source of pride for us. We know ourselves that we can still do better, but there are cases in Iceland's contemporary history and, and society where we can proudly say that we're doing well, and gender equality is one of them. So if other states and nations and peoples want to improve their societies, if you want to improve gender equality, for instance, you can look at the Icelandic example and, ipso facto, that's one case where we are certainly uh, playing a role on the international scene. Now, I have more or less said what I wanted to say when it came to Iceland's role on the international scene. So I thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure for, to return to lecturer mode. <laughs> but believe me, it's sometimes difficult to have been a historian, an academic, where you're meant to be critical, you're meant to criticize the authorities, your own authorities. You should never think, what's best for my state, what's best for my country? You should think, you know, what should I say, what should I conclude, what should I focus on, regardless of any real or imagined interests of the state. But now, in my position as head of state, it's almost written in the job description to be optimistic and speak well of your state and your nation. And I'm blessed with the fact that I am head of state in Iceland, a beautiful country, a brilliant country, a great country. I, think, I can think of some countries where this transition would be slightly more difficult. But still, uh, it is challenging to move from the world of academia to the world of head of state. But a tremendous honor every day, and to have this opportunity to speak to you like this is, uh, is an example of that. So thank you very much for listening. Now I want to encourage you to ask questions if there are any, and I will be happy to answer them, I think and hope. Thank you very much.